Welcome, comrades, the Spectre of Communism podcast. The Bolivarian Revolution was a beacon of light in a dark period for the international class struggle. The workers and poor of Venezuela, rallying behind the figure of Hugo Chavez, took on the oligarchs and the imperialists. The country's vast oil wealth was reinvested into providing jobs and homes. And to this day, years after the death of Hugo Chavez, the Bolivarian Revolution is still an inspiration to class fighters around the world. Venezuela is also held up as a boogeyman by the reactionaries and right-wingers around the world, particularly in the United States. They say that Venezuela is an example of how socialism can never work. There are many lessons of the Bolivarian Revolution. The impossibility of socialism is not one of them, but... It is a lesson in the limitations of reformism and the necessity to complete a revolutionary process once begun. It also highlights, in particular, the question of workers' control. Workers seizing control of factories and farms was a particular feature of the Venezuelan Revolution. And we're very fortunate today to have with us from Caracas, Luis Romero, who is a leading member of Lucha de Classes, the Venezuelan section of the RCI to talk to us today about the Venezuelan revolution in general, but particularly the question of workers' control. Luis, thanks so much for joining us. Saludos, muchas gracias. A specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism is stronger, more determined than ever. Communism. Communism. The communism. The communism. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? It goes without saying that the Venezuelan revolution is at a very dangerous and difficult juncture. But Lewis, if you don't mind, I'd like to start at the very beginning. Can we talk about the origins of the Bolivarian Revolution, starting with the 1989 Caracaso and the coup in 1992? The Bolivarian Revolution, historically, was this event that brought the masses and the workers of Venezuela to political life. This revolution made the poor masses aware of their own interests and moved them towards organizing for the transformation of society. This process, it was quite confusing, it was contradicting, had this feature of starting as a very moderate movement and then transforming into something big and the explicit fight for socialism. To understand this, I think it's better for us to understand the general processes of capitalism in Venezuela. The international division of labor, the world market, but also American imperialism turned Venezuela into a mere exporter of oil, given the vast amount of this resource in our country. Like in many countries, you have in Venezuela this character of backwardness, economic backwardness, cultural backwardness, all combined, combined with small islands of advanced capitalist development, particularly around the oil industry in Venezuela. The Venezuelan capitalism developed this rentier economy, which relied solely on oil. So here the economy is centered around the division of the oil industry. And historically, the ruling class of our country and also the bureaucracy have funneled billions of dollars out of the country. So in this context of the backwardness of capitalism in Venezuela, boom and a bust dynamic are solely tied to the situation with oil. So after Venezuela benefit a lot from the energy crisis and the crude oil crisis in the 70s, by the next decade, things had turned into their opposite. Oil prices dropped and the authorities didn't bat an eyelid into implementing austerity. So in 89, the new government, alongside the IMF, started to implement a lot of austerity. With currency exchanges, oil prices, so mass frustration burst on the 27th of February of 89, when spontaneously within the neighborhoods, people rebelled, defeating the repression for about three days in Caracas and some other towns. And this opened a revolutionary upswing that definitely scared the bourgeoisie. But a lack of a revolutionary party that has roots within the working class 
led to a failure of this revolutionary upswing and ultimately to its defeat. Now, this outburst of energy is known as the Caracaso. Then the repression went into the offensive, where it's estimated that about 3,000 people were killed. Even though the movement had been defeated, the political establishment had been discredited to the eyes of the masses. Precisely, the roots of the Bolivarian Revolution come from the crumbling of the establishment, where the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats would take turns in power, basically. Always working in the interests of imperialism, of capitalism, all while impoverishing the masses. This mass discontent ended up seeping into the military, actually. From the beginnings of the 80s, you had this nationalist movement, MDR, which had rank-and-file soldiers that were trying to reclaim the legacy of Simón Bolívar. The MDR was radicalized by the events from the Caracaso, at the time, this movement was led by Lieutenant Hugo Chávez. 4th of February, 92, Hugo Chávez was involved in this conspiracy for a coup attempt to overthrow the government. This coup attempt failed. He had some you know, medium-rank officers that took some quarters. But the movement was quite small. Chavez himself said a few years later that this was a mistake. But this initiative was aiming to bring about this right-wing coup that was actually brewing. So even though it was a mistake, Chavez and his movement kind of expressed this popular discontent. After serving some time in jail, Chavez left prison and then he participated in the elections and in 98 he was elected president. And I think it's right to say that the different left-wing parties in Venezuela at the time were not able to take the opportunity of the collapse of the establishment right after the Caracaso. Some, like the Communist Party of Venezuela, paid the price of abandoning the revolution by taking the guerrilla tactic that was popularized in the 60s, and this led to nothing. This led to the death of many of their cadres, for them to become distant from the class struggle in the cities. And when they were able to go back into legal activity, they just adapted to bourgeois parliamentarism. Other organizations like Causa R lost their influence among the masses, this is from their very opportunist tendencies during the 90s. So in the end, Chavez was just filling the void that was left by these organizations. So Hugo Chavez is demonized in the West as a brutal dictator who led his country to ruin. But what kind of a figure was Hugo Chavez and what kind of support did he have in the country at the time? And more importantly, how do we explain that support? To talk about Hugo Chavez is to talk about someone that reflects the contradictions within the revolution that he led. I think it's noteworthy to talk about the political evolution of Hugo Chavez. He arrived in power defending nationalist positions full of illusions on bourgeois democracy. He spoke about Bolivarian ideals and liberal ideals to promote internal national investment within the private sector. Despite this, we can say that at first he was an honest reformist. He was seriously interested in improving working people's lives. Precisely this intent is what led them to introduce reforms. These reforms were not that deep, but still were fought against by the right wing and the pro-imperialist wing. And with all these measures, I think one of the most notorious is the land law. So the land law, the ley de tierra, was meaning to introduce an agrarian reform, which was still a pending task in the history of Venezuela. But above all, 
con la cual buscaba the petrol eh, mejor control sobre la industria petrolera, which was looking to better plan how the oil industry was working within Venezuela. And with this, he was seeking to better distribute the wealth within the country. And I think it's remarkable that something as small as this was still being rejected by the bourgeoisie. It's proof of this backwardness and parasitic nature of the bourgeoisie, not just in Venezuela, but the whole of Latin America. The national bourgeoisie in Venezuela was always strongly linked to the American imperialists. But also to the landowners. That's why the Creole bourgeoisie was tied to the backwardness of our country. And just as this was the case in Russia a hundred years ago, any chance of progress on an economic front lies on the working class. The Venezuelan bourgeoisie was actually working towards the privatization of the oil industry at the time. And while there was a national oil industry, they were trying to make it an autonomous entity. And the reasons are pretty clear. From 75 to the year 2000, it's estimated that the Venezuelan bourgeoisie funneled over $3 billion, which of course came from the oil industry. And it's for this reason that they were orchestrating this coup in 2002 with full support from the United States, which, however, it did fail as soon as the masses took to the streets in Venezuela. So the people that live in the neighborhoods stopped the coup and they reinstated Chavez into power. At that time, Chavez didn't think about retaliating against the bourgeoisie for what they had done to him. They were practically defeated already on the streets and also um, within the military. A few months later, the bourgeoisie and imperialism would come out again on the attack. So we said at the beginning that Chavez was an honest reformist. And all these attacks from the bourgeoisie, from the imperialists, were radicalizing him as well as the masses. Very few times in history, I would say, you can see such a sharp turn in someone's political development. Two years after this coup from 2002, Chavez openly declared the anti-imperialist character of this revolution. And a year after declaring it as an anti-imperialist revolution, he declared it as a socialist revolution. For the presidential elections in 2006, which he won with 60% of the votes, the program was summed up in just one word, and that's socialism. Such a push on the political front is not an accident. Marx used to say that the whip of counter-revolution spurs on the revolution. And the fast radicalization of the masses were pushing Hugo Chavez to go even further further left. And Chavez, with his speeches, he also spurred on the masses to keep going. He welcomed them to occupy factories, to take the unused land and to get organized. So that made Chavez the first person to wave the banner of socialism in a significant way since the fall of the Berlin Wall. However, we also have to highlight that Chavez did make mistakes. One of those mistakes was never breaking away with the bureaucratic elements within the government, who were the ones actually stopping his initiatives. Behind his back, they were attacking the workers. And these are the same people that, after Chavez's death, have destroyed all the conquests from the revolution. They have suffocated all the experiences of workers' control, of self-management. Nicolás Maduro and his gang have led it to the collapse of the country's economy. This phenomenon was actually worsened by the sanctions imposed by President Donald Trump. 
Maduro has pushed for this set of austerity that has been the harshest in Venezuelan history, if not Latin American history. And this leads us to the consequences of not completing a revolution. Before we get onto that in detail, I want to talk a bit more about the movements of factory occupations and land occupations by the workers and peasants. Because certainly from the outside, this was one of the most inspiring aspects of the Bolivarian Revolution. The oligarchs, supported by the imperialists, trying to sabotage the revolution and the workers and peasants fighting back. Can we go into a bit more detail about the lockouts and subsequent occupation of the state oil company? So the same sectors that were there left unpunished were the same that from 2002 to 2003 halted the oil industry. This was done by the bourgeoisie through the um, management of Petroles de Venezuela, which is the state company. This management had walked out, they took passwords, they took software, they took hardware for a highly complex industry. It required satellites, it had automated systems. This was for the extraction of oil as well as gas. So this was an attempt to harm the national economy and to push for the working people to abandon the government. And despite this sabotage on behalf of the bourgeois from 2002 to 2003, like I said, also halted a good chunk of Venezuelan industry and business. And this attempt to paralyze the economy started the entrance of the working class into the revolutionary scene, trying to leave their mark. Firstly, oil workers, as well as people that actually used to work in the industry but had retired, they came together, they took over the machinery to restart production. And restarting production is not just for the sake of stopping this coup, but also to fundamentally defend the revolution. This first started with a lot of manual labor being put in to counteract the technological boycott being imposed by management. But then the workers themselves were able to regain control of the tech. These very complex tech-wise processes were able to be carried out without management, without the bosses. The workers were not fully conscious of the magnitude of what they were doing including moments before the boycott in the whole history of the petrol industry. When management went on holiday, it was the same workers that were taking control and carrying out all these tasks. At the same time, in the south of Venezuela, the Alcasa, an aluminum company, had the same movement on behalf of the workers to restart production. The same bourgeois-led boycott of the economy. Gas companies were denying the supply for Alcasa to produce the aluminum. And then the workers then occupied the gas works and restarted the supply for Alcasa. Going back to the petrol industry, had very particular experiences, exceptional, more like. You had trade union leaders that were overseeing factories that were directly controlled by workers, were the ones in charge of petrol production in other areas. They would then place orders for gas to kickstart the supply in these areas. On oil industry level, this workers 
intervention led to solving a lot of problems, actually. You have areas where you process liquid gas. They had the machinery that was for exclusive use of turning the gas into liquid gas, and then it would be transported onto another processing plant. But the places that were occupied had control of the containers that were carrying liquid gas. And they were accumulating too much liquid gas in the processing plant without being able to transport it. And the machinery that they had could only work one way, which is turning the, the gas into liquid gas, but it couldn't revert the process. And even then, the workers, by working around the, the machinery, they managed to make it so that they, it could also revert the process, so it could turn gas to liquid gas and liquid gas into gas back again. And here I want to highlight this fundamental idea. The bourgeois and their mouthpieces always insist that workers are not capable of leading the economy. When it's precisely the workers that every single day are carrying out production. And the only role that the bosses are completing is giving orders and benefiting from someone else's labor. And it's very interesting how necessity pushes the creative genius of the working class. And in this way, with the workers' intervention, the boycott was able to be brought down. And another detail that I would really like to emphasize has to do with the fact that the communities that live near the oil processing plants with the same intention of bringing down the boycott, they would surround the factory so they could support the workers while they were trying to restart production. Here you see the leading character of the working class and how they can lead the masses, basically, to take power. Later, after the boycott has been defeated, many companies didn't restart operations. Even though the boycott was defeated, a lot of bosses decided not to restart production, and this left a lot of workers astray. And here we enter what would be the second stage of this process, in which the workers from many companies and industries, they would occupy the factories, they would start entering the gates of these factories. Maybe to defend their right to work. This boycott on behalf of the bourgeoisie was meant to be indefinite. Chavez, in a press conference in 2004-2005, contemplated the possibility of expropriating, nationalizing about 1,200 factories that were left closed. But a layer of the bosses, which are grouped together, said that in the first 10 years of the 21st century, about 4,000 companies shut down. And here is where the Benebal workers, which is a paper factory, took the charge. They were pushing for a campaign for the nationalizing of industry, very bold campaign, and they were pushing for the nationalization of an industry that they had already occupied. 
Constructora Nacional de Válvulas. Simultaneously, workers from a valve building company. Que se encargaba de producir which, las of course, produced the valves used by the oil industry, remained shut, and the workers for months were sat by the gates of these factories to stop the workers from taking out stocks from the company because they were in a huge deficit, especially with unpaid wages. A few months later, the workers break into the factory and they begin an occupation. This process, led by Beneval and also this bulb company, at the same time, workers all over the country were starting a similar initiative across different industries. The Venepal workers presented a campaign to Chavez himself, which approved the nationalization of Venepal and also this Valve company. They changed their name. Benepal became Inbepal, Cinebe, which is the valve company, became Inbepal. This is very significant because while the boycott was happening, the Ministry of Industry was really confused. It was paralyzed by what was going on. And at first, the ministry supported and pushed for the factory occupations. Even a minister at the time, Maria Cristina Iglesias, was promoting for the workers to get organized to participate in the occupations, for them to put forward projects. Unfortunately, the trade union leadership back then in the CNT, they didn't take this as an opportunity to begin a campaign, a campaign for workers' control, for workers' participation in production, in management, and therefore in the deepening of a revolutionary process that would have fundamentally changed the social relations of production. Other companies had similar experiences. And Hugo Chavez, for instance, pushed for workers' assemblies to elect their own leaders and representatives. Going back to this Valve company, Inbeval, where a machine that was making things more productive, it began to break down. The former owner of the factory had just shut down that line of production because the machine had to be imported from Europe. However, the workers fixed it. They invented their own piece. They made it themselves. It didn't exist in Venezuela. They came up with it and it worked. And examples like this, you can find them all over the country. It shows that workers' control is even more productive than the anarchy of the capitalist market. The best experience regarding workers' control definitely is Alcasa, which then started to link up with different companies across the south of Venezuela. The factories in the south of Venezuela specialize in metal production, heavy machinery also. And this led to the Guayana Socialista plan, a plan that comes from the workers themselves to start workers' control, to use workers' control across all these companies down the south of Venezuela as an example for workers' control all over the country. Yeah, and I think we can move on to the next question. No, these are really inspiring stories, and you've already alluded to some of the contradictions involved in the occupied workplaces, occupied factories movements. And you talked about how the 
occupation movement was never expanded into a nationwide movement of workers' control to deepen the revolution. But can I ask what measures did the bosses take in order to sabotage the Occupy Factories movement? And what other issues and problems did the workers run into? Regarding the contradictions, I think we can mention that there were some layers of the worker in a trade union that in the face of the boycott, they proposed new bosses to manage the enterprises. This wasn't a generalized picture all over the country. Most of the people had a, a better class position, but it shows how people were thinking at the time. These same layers of workers that led very interesting initiatives during the boycott when the Ministry of Industry reached out to them asking, what do you need? They replied with, bosses, managers, we need management. But of course, then after the boycott's over, they get together, they draw a balance sheet. They reached the conclusion that they could carry out the revolution without any need for anything. And this is part of these contradictions, but I think the biggest contradiction was introduced by the bureaucracy. Because at the time of legalizing these occupied factories, they established that these companies would work like a stock company, where 51% belonged to the state. The workers had to organize in cooperatives and the topic of the cooperatives introduced a very interesting topic in this whole thing about workers control the problem with these cooperatives comes from the fact that it links the improvement of workers conditions and wages with the performance and production of these companies, which kind of leads to this like self-exploitation dynamic. So to attempt to keep up with production, they will cut the wages. And this is what has happened in almost all experiences of cooperatives with all experiences across the whole world. It's not just this. It's not just this. Cooperatives come with a whole assortment of problems, including that workers feel like the bosses of the industry. This perpetuates a capitalist relation that gets in the way of a socialist development, especially as it was already advancing under workers' control. Historically, as Marxists, we've opposed this form of organization. Because above all, we think the means of production have to be nationalized. They must be in the hands of the workers, but where production and surplus is shared among society. And the problems that arise from these trends that come from the cooperatives led to circumstances like in Nepal. They would hire workers to exploit them. They would hire them on more precarious contracts. There were some similar examples, but in Nepal at the start, workers still held assemblies. And in more than one occasion, they recalled the leadership within this company for making decisions that were conflicting with the interests of the revolution. Workers from Indeval, that former Valve company, even rejected and then dissolved the cooperative. This is quite significant. 
in regards of the sabotage of the boycott on behalf of bourgeoisie and some bureaucratic elements. We had the usual experience of workers' control within the capitalist system. We have bosses boycott, we have the bosses cutting off relations with customers, with buyers, they try to stop sales, they try to stop the buyers. And this puts forward the challenges of propelling workers' control initiatives when you haven't transformed the social relations of production. In the end, you have these pockets of socialism surrounded by an ocean of capitalism, where the pressures from the market suffocated. And generally, workers' control is fleeting because it comes from a period of the sharpening of the class struggle in which workers go into action, but then this doesn't go forward if this is not carried on to the socialist transformation of society. To starting a planned economy, plenty of these experiences end up in failure precisely by the pressures of the world market. This is an important lesson. Now, how did the bureaucracy boycott these initiatives? In the case of Inmeval, they were accused by new management of the oil industry alongside with Chavez, they were accusing the Valve company by the oil industry that they weren't fulfilling orders and they weren't providing the Valves. There was a specific case in with Chavez with a few other representatives in a meeting. Here you had Jorge Paredes, who was the leader of the company, but he was appointed by the workers to be so. And Chavez confronts him if that was true. If it was true that they were underperforming and that they were not fulfilling the orders for the oil industry. To which he replied that was false. In fact, the oil industry was actually demanding things that were not fit for the Valve company to solve. For instance, they would ship off valves back to Indeval to be fixed with machinery that Indeval didn't have. This revealed the conscious boycott and sabotage to undermine the achievements of planning the industry. And then you have the case of Guayana Socialista, Juan. So a conglomerate of industries, so aluminum and other metals, had appointed some leaders. The workers themselves had appointed leaders. So that when Chavez falls ill again with cancer towards the end of 2012, and then he goes to Cuba to seek treatment, the bureaucracy issued an order to fire these leaders. There's many other examples of bureaucratic sabotage. Then from the bureaucracy, they were demanding military managers. First, some of the workers fought back against this, like it was the case with Vienna Industries. However, these soldiers planted themselves and pushed against the workers so that they could put themselves as the managers within the industry. Of course, following Chavez's death, the bureaucracy had no obstacles in its way to crush workers' control. And the results are clear for everyone to see. Bureaucratic control in which the workers have no say in the decisions being taken. Inevitably, it leads to corruption, maneuvering, 
which we know not as an exception under capitalism, but the norm. And currently we have an endless amount of nationalized industries completely at a standstill. We have many industries that were heavily invested in, yet they haven't reported any amount of growth or productivity. That's the case with the companies in Guyana, like Alcasa, like Sidor. And it clearly shows how the bureaucracy ended up suffocating all these experiments that were actually the seeds of a new society. Y eh, demuestra de manera clara eh, cómo el control burocrático eh, al final eh, terminó asfixiando todos estos experimentos que eran la semilla de la nueva sociedad. All right, thank you so much, Lewis. This has been a really fascinating discussion, full of lessons, and it's great to hear from our Venezuelan comrades so that people can hear what really happens during the Venezuelan revolution. We can cut through the propaganda and we can talk about what was achieved and also the reasons for the problems that the revolution fell into. So I'll just end by asking, what's your final message to our listeners, our viewers, about the experience of the Venezuelan revolution and with workers' control? The first fundamental lesson in regards to workers' control in Venezuela. It showed that the working class is capable of kickstarting production, including very complex technical industries like the oil industry. There's nothing like it in the 21st century. But when you have an incomplete revolution, the bureaucracy started taking over, and slowly but surely, they were sending back all of the progress that the workers had achieved, all their committees and their leadership. And this has caused a lot of frustration, and it's put a, a sour taste on these experiences. And the second lesson, and I think the most important of all, is that workers' control implies the necessity of transforming the social relations of production with a planned economy and production in function of social need. So when you have these isolated experiences of socialist islands in a sea of capitalism, sooner or later, they can be crushed. And one last lesson, I think it's very important to highlight, that in Venezuela, socialism didn't fail because it was never implemented. We had experiences and efforts from the workers to perpetuate their achievements, to carry them on, but they were crushed by the bureaucracy, despite the big inroads of the workers they didn't take power. To be more clear, the, the bureaucracy stopped them from taking power. In Venezuela, what failed was an attempt to control a backward capitalism, which caused disarray in the national market. The revolution didn't lead to the crisis that we're seeing in Venezuela, but it was leaving this revolution incomplete expropriating the monopolies, the banks, the land. This could have been the solution to avoid all the issues that we're faced with at the moment. Despite this, the Bolivarian Revolution gave us endless lessons that we have to study. So we can arm with theory a new generation of revolutionary fighters. Thank you very much. Okay, gracias, Luis. And those invaluable lessons are also now available to all of our listeners. So I think this has been a very important episode. There's plenty of material on the Bolivarian Revolution available on Marxist.com, including first-hand accounts of the occupied industries in Venezuela 
And the comrades of the Revolutionary Communists of America have just recently released a podcast about the question of the Bolivarian Revolution, which I also recommend, and I'll put links to all of this in the description to this episode. So we'll say goodbye to Lewis from Caracas, and we'll see all of you next week for a new episode. A spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism. <laughs>